welcome to Salt Lake. Thank you. Thank you very much for showing up for me. Thank you. I think they're going to take a photograph of What's that? I think they're going to take a photograph of really quickly. We're going to do a photo. Michael, if you'll stand right up here in the front. You guys want to pull out your cell phones and light them up like that so everybody can see it perfect right here? On the count of three, you want to turn around and we have a professional photographer who's going to take your photo. Okay, guys, on the count of three, I want you guys to go nuts. Ready? One, two, three. Yeah. All right, perfect. Up. So, uh... Sit down. Let's sit down. I can do that. How's everybody doing? Great. So the first thing I want to ask about is probably something no one expected to hear about today. But uh, I was going through movies watching uh, from your career to prepare for this, and I found you in Greece. What? Uh, what happened uh, with Greece was uh, I was uh, uh, reading, uh, auditioning for the role that Lorenzo Lamas eventually played in the movie. And, um, you know, they put me through two or three readings and uh, they decided they were going to cast Lorenzo Lamas. And, um, I think they kind of felt bad for me, so they like threw me a bone, which was a day's work. And if you look closely in that movie, when John Travolta is trying to impress Levy and John, uh, that he's an athlete, um, he one sequence is playing basketball, and uh, he punches a kid in the stomach who's got the basketball, and that's me. Yeah. <laughs> I believe, and I, you know, it's been a long time, but I believe there's a, a shot um, in that movie, too, where in the classroom, Kaneki pulls out a frog, and it causes all sorts of problems, and I believe the shot starts, it's kind of a tracking shot across a couple of, basically what I did was extra work, but they paid me as an actor, and they cross a girl, and I think they cross me in full frame at the beginning of the shot before the scene really starts. So I'm not credited in the in the movie, but uh, yeah, yeah. But it was it's it's so wonderful. I mean, Travolta is just like just incredible in that movie. I mean, he's incredible anyway. But I just, I mean, man, it, it, it's a great, great movie. So how did you get, um, your career kind of went through some evolutions before everything we probably know you from today, and, and you, you jumped sort of from that to stalking Lauren Bacall in The Fan. Uh, and I'm wondering, I mean, Lauren Bacall, uh, you're early in your career, and she's sort of, she was this legend of Hollywood. Um, what was that like, working with someone like, like her in your early career? You know, my mother always said to me, if you don't have something nice to say about somebody. Okay. Uh, so the intensity of that role, I read, is what helped, uh, what helped you get, the, uh, get your foot in the door for Terminator. But Terminator, at the time when it was made, now we all think of it as this classic that was amazing. But on paper back then, Maybe it seemed a little dodgy. Well, you know, uh, Jim Cameron has said before that he had seen the fan and he liked the idea that somebody as angelic as I looked in the fan could be as evil as I was in the movie. And, um, you know, I got sent the script, and I knew that uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger was going to be starring in the movie. And I read the script, and, you know, I'm not going to be like everybody else and go like, ah, it was an incredible script, you know, like I knew right away. You know, I, I thought it was a good script, and then I, 
you know, I, I asked uh, my agent, well, I mean, because Arnold Schwarzenegger at that time was not somebody that a young actor who loved De Niro and Pacino and Dustin Hoffman and Paul Newman and, and you know, Steve McQueen, you know, it's not somebody that we really wanted to co-star with necessarily. Although he didn't have anything to say um, in the movie, or much, um, you know, and, and I give Arnold all the credit in the world for, like, from where he came to where he is now, is like Bill Burr, as a comedian, does a piece on him, and uh, it's very funny, but it's also, you know, shows like a movie star. I mean, nobody, nobody, nobody thought at that time. So. It didn't have a lot going on for it. Then I asked who was directing it. They said Jim Cameron, and I said, who's he? And they said, well, he, he works for, Ro done a movie for Roger Corman. Roger Corman uh, was known for kind of like B movies. A lot of, a lot of filmmakers got their starts there. Um, uh, Scorsese. I think Scorsese did Bo uh, Boxcar, Boxcar Bertha. Bertha and, um, Eat My Dust with Ron Howard uh, was, you know, I'm sure there are a, 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 a lot of people, but it was a B movie, B movie house. And I had worked, I'd done The Fan, which was a big movie, and, and I've done a, lot, done a lot of television and so forth. And I said, well, who's, who's producing it? Gail Hurd. Well, who's Gail Hurd? Well, she's, you know, also. And I, so, the, what I, the reason I did that movie was because I loved the character so much. And I thought, here's a guy I can play that is like an action hero kind of stud, like cool action guy. But I recognized right away that the love story was really a beautiful love story. And certainly back in those days, and I don't, I mean, I. I don't know how many action movies have that kind of love story that, 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 that is as powerful as that was. And so I knew that I could play that role and, um, and the way that I thought about it was, because you know, if that was done by somebody else, that movie, other than Jim Cameron, done by a director who was kind of like so-so, it would have been really stupid. It just would have been terrible. You know, I can guarantee you, if it was not Jim Cameron who made that movie, it just would have been like, like not good. And uh, so I thought like, well, I'd be able to play my scenes and I'd be able to at least get that footage from that character. And, uh, and so I took the role and then um, before we started shooting, um, Arnold Schwarzenegger's uh, was doing Conan, uh, he, his option got picked up by Dino De Laurentiis and he had to go do his Conan, the Barbarian uh, sequel. So we had three months uh, that Jim and I got to spend a lot of time with. And I, I got to spend a lot of time with Jim and I, I went down and spent a lot of time with Stan Winston who is the sixth, seven time Academy Award winning special effects um, guy. And, you know, once I was in the special effects house and I saw them working and got to know Jim, you know, <coughs> you know, I started taking it more seriously that it could be a good movie, you know. I never, you know, you know, there were no Comic Cons back then, but never, never thought that, that 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 movie, even with Jim and even with Stan Winston, who at that point had done nothing, absolutely nothing, you know, would ever be kind of the like the the, the classic that it is. And, and, and even at that time, you know, you go to Rotten Tomatoes or whatever, you know, they give it a hundred. It's just not the way it was. That that was not reviewed across the board like this like great movie, it just wasn't. And um, that movie came out in 1984 and was not even in the top 20 box office movies, you know? The Karate Kid 2 made twice as much money as The Terminator. And uh, so even Orion didn't realize what they had. So, you know, they, 
the movie came out, it did well. It was made for $6.5 million, it made $40 million. Hemdale and, and Orion did well with it. If they would have put it in more theaters, if they would have realized what they had, they probably could have made a lot more money, but that's, that's Hollywood. And uh, um, I think that really the, that movie became more popular because that was the beginning of VHS. That's when people start, first started getting the VHS machines. And uh, for all you young people, that was... Uh, <laughs> Uh, something that we used to play movies on, um, and um, um, and you know, slowly but surely, you know, people recognized it for what it is. And then, of course, Jim went on to do Aliens, and it was off to the races with Jim. And At what point did you realize the Terminator had been something special? I can imagine in that that lull where it's picking up on VHS. Maybe you don't realize that it's going to be this cultural touchstone that it was. At what point did you? Um, key into that? Probably when I did my first Comic-Con. Really? I mean, to be perfectly honest with you, yeah. I mean, I, you know, the effect that that movie, Aliens, uh, Tombstone, uh, The Rock. <laughs> Thank you, Lunker. Uh, the effect that it had on people, I was, you know, not aware of. I mean, when you're 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 not in front of, a, of an audience, you just don't realize um, the effect. That, now, when I was growing up, I had, you know, I looked up at like I looked up at like Paul Newman, as like a movie star, you know, and I, you know, if he, he affected me in my life, and movies that I saw affected me, and and and, and but you know. One of the really fun things about coming to Comic-Con is like giving people the opportunity to meet me because there's just like, these movies have meant so much to them in their lives and they've seen them over and over and over. And you know, I can tell, you know, I still have like, you know, people that are like this big that come up with their mothers and say, I love you, I love Kyle Reese, you know, or I love Aliens, you know. And I'm like, what's your favorite movie? And I say, Aliens. I'm like, oh, come on, you know, like really, truly, like, uh, you know, like Superman, or what's really your favorite movie? No, Aliens are my favorite movie, you know. The fact that our parents let her watch the movie when she was that tall, you know. My, I think I was with my son, he was about 12 before he watched it, but, uh, you know, it's been a, it's been a, a long, um, very, I'm very blessed, very blessed to, and I think I kind of hit the lottery, there are a lot of great actors out there, um, and I just, you know, I want to say I got lucky because I worked real hard, and when I played those characters, I took them very seriously, and I was very, very intense and collaborative um, with Jim and um, other directors that I worked with. But I worked really, really hard on 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 all the movies that I did, and the ones that um, that weren't as good, I tried as hard as I could to make better. It, it definitely shows. Um, talking about Aliens a little bit, Aliens is uh, one of these movies that, that I think uh, it might even be more recognized than Terminator. And you almost weren't a part of it. And I'm wondering, um, the, the part of Corporal Hicks had gone to someone else and you were sort of brought in at, 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 uh, after a couple weeks of shooting. And I'm wondering, the cast had gone through all, all this training and whatnot and you sort of came in uh, afterward, what was it like stepping foot on that set? Well, I, um, I knew that Jim was making the movie, and I knew that Hicks was the part that I could play. And I had a big agent at the time, he handled Richard Gere and, and, and uh, Mel Gibson, and a lot, a lot of big people throughout the years, Michelle Pfeiffer and so on and so forth. And 
basically he called Jim and Jim said, you know, I don't think it's going to work for Michael with this movie. And, you know, I didn't really expect, you know, to, you know, okay, you know, he's going to cast somebody else that he's got his eye on and that was fine. Um, I had other, you know, things that I, uh, you know, I uh, could be working on. And um, so they went into production and I didn't pay much attention to it. And I was in Studio City, California, and I got a call on a Friday from Gail. And she said, is your passport up to date? And I said, yeah. And she said, can you come over here? We're um, replacing um, the actor who is um, uh, playing Hicks. And I said, <laughs> uh, let me think about it. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. Um, so I got that call on a Friday afternoon. And Monday morning, I was on the set. And I got to skip all that training stuff and, you know, like, all geared up and ready to go. And it was not that difficult for me because, first of all, um, I had worked with Jim and Gail. I had just done the Terminator for them. And um, they knew me and I knew them and uh, they knew what I could provide and, and I knew how talented they were. And I would also worked with Bill Paxton before. Woo! Good hand for Bill. We did a movie together uh, called Lords of Discipline and uh, Jim actually, I mean uh, Bill actually introduced me to Jim at a uh, screening once uh, before I went in and, and auditioned for him for The Terminator. But uh, um, So I had kind of a safety net as far as like I wasn't just thrown into a situation and if you look at the script, you know, you could probably take everything that Hicks says and put it on two, you know, t uh, two pages of the script, you know. He wasn't a real talky-talky kind of guy. It wasn't like, you know, Bill, you know. Uh, so it wasn't like I had that, you know, four months to learn like 20 lines. It was not that big of a deal. So I was just excited. I went in there and the sets were, you know, at Pinewood Studios, they were like just unbelievable. And I, everybody knew, there's a documentary on YouTube about the making of Aliens that everybody should watch. And it's just, you know, it was one of those movies that everybody felt after the Terminator, this could be really good, this could be really good. And um, so everybody felt that way. And, um, you know, I, there was never any backbiting. There was never any, you know, you know, jealousy among the cast or, you know, and Sigourney was a great leader. I mean, she, she was... She was always, you know, kind of ready. And then, like the first person on the set, when you're like a movie star or whatever, you know, you, you know, it's protocol that like when the star of the movie is ready to shoot the shot, you better be on the set, you know, because when she leaves her trailer and walks out, she doesn't want to be waiting on Michael Bean, you know. And, uh, you know, there's all these stories about actors that hang out in the trailers and so on and so forth. But she works really, really hard. As great as she is, as beautiful as she is, as, you know, one of the things I think that, 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 that Jim likes so much about her is her, her work ethic is, is un, really un, unbelievable. One of the, the things that makes Aliens so special, I think, is, is how real it feels. And I've heard actors talk about how when you don't have anything to say, it's actually a little harder to act because you're reacting to things, especially things that are fantastic, uh, like Aliens. Um, what was the difficulty for you in adding that, that intensity to Aliens, if any? Like, what was that like having to react to things that weren't there or maybe mock-ups of Stan Winston's work? Or... Well, you know, acting is just acting. And, you know, and I've been doing it since I was you know, 10 years old and playing in the backyard with my brothers. We used to watch a, a old television show called The Wild Wild West. <laughs> they made it into, with Robert Conrad, they made it into a movie that um, was, uh, <laughs> not my opinion, I'm just saying box office wise, I don't think it did, did real well. So, I mean, I would act like, uh, he always had to play up Artemis Gordon and I got to play James West. And Yeah, we used to play Army and you know, there's really no difference between that 
and what I do as an actor. And so if you tell me there's a monster standing in front of me, I'll act like there's a monster standing in front of me. It doesn't really help. Well, it maybe helps a little bit, you know, that uh, if you actually have an alien dressed up in a suit standing there, but you know that there are men inside of the suit, you know, it's like, you know, it's just acting, you know. It's, for me, it's no harder to act, um, uh, you know, to a blue, a red, blue, uh, green screen or, you know, no aliens and you just have to do reactions and so on and so forth. Um, it's just acting. It's just, just acting like what you do is you try to find out as much as you can about the type of character that you're playing and how they would react in situations. And then, you know, people always thought of, I would, you know, like, God, oh, you're so fucking intense, dude. You're so intense, you know. And I'm like, well, you know, the situations I was in were pretty intense, you know, the Terminator, Aliens, the Abyss, you know, those were pretty intense times, you know, for a guy. So um, I can remember being, I was doing Magnificent Seven at the time. And, uh, and, I was I was at the uh, the the, the uh, whatever table that you know that they have that you can get like snacks and stuff um, craft service table right and uh, I had an actor come up to me and he said like dude man you just like you're so fucking intense. excuse me excuse me dude man you're so so intense like what like what what are you thinking I'm like. Uh, Fritos or Doritos? <laughs> and um, so I, I, I've always had something about me that like this side of my face is kind of a heroic and this side of my face is a little bit devilish and um, so I've always played, you know, in the abyss of course I played in the fan that you talked about with Lauren Bacall, I was always the bad guy, I played a lot of, a lot of uh, bad guys. Um, which, which none of them are bad guys, in my opinion, but, you know, in the opinion of audiences, you know, supposedly they're bad. We took some questions online, and I've got one from uh, Mark Middlemas, who asked on the Salt Lake Comic Con Facebook page, speaking of The Abyss, what inspired what they felt was a, an against-type performance from you in The Abyss? Excuse me, what, 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 what inspired your performance in The Abyss? Because it, it doesn't feel like some many of the other things that, that you're more well-known for? Well, you know, I mean, it, it's, I mean, it's a military guy. Um, I was basically, you know, I look at that character and people always say, oh, he's such a great bad guy, such a great bad guy. And I look at that character, and I can do this with, with you know, Val, if Val was sitting here, you know, I can do this with Johnny Ringo, too. But, I, you know, I look at this character and I say to him, you know, that, like, first of all, he's He's cut off from the chain of command. You know, he's not used to making decisions, and all of a sudden, he's in charge of what's going on down there. And then he gets the underwater nervous deal going on, and he's kind of freaking out about that. And then he's got people coming up to them, him, telling him that, you know, there are aliens in the water. It's like, what would you think if somebody came up and said, oh, there's an alien in the parking lot. Like, let's all go look at him, you know? And their proof that the, the, the proof that there were aliens in the water was Mary Elizabeth Antonio's like little picture of a little yellow, little yellow squib. And that was it. That was all I had to work on. And I thought like, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think that this is something more nefarious and I'm gonna get rid of it. Right? Oh, where's the bad guy in that? You know? I might have saved this from a bunch of, well, I guess not. So I think, based on the reaction so far, everybody kind of wants to talk about Tombstone a little bit. And based on the reaction, um, we got an online questions. We had four or five different people ask about the pistol flipping. Uh, your pistol work in Tombstone, how much practice did you put into that? How, uh, is that just a skill you had? And you were like, hey guys, I can do this, or? Yeah, they called me up and uh, I had that routine already down. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I got offered that job by Kevin Jar, and Kevin wrote the script, and um, 
Originally, they called me up and they they said they sent me the script. My agent, this big agent of mine, very very famous agent at the time, and uh, they sent me the script and they said, "Is there any part in here? Kurt was already set. Is there any part in here you want to play?" And I said, um, "Yeah, Doc Holliday. It's the role I want to play." And I said, "Well, you know, got back to me. Well, it looks like that might be going to Val Kilmer. Is there any other role that you want to play?" It's like, I mean, right away, Johnny Ringo. So he uh, immediately, you know, gave me the role and paid me fairly and so on and so forth. And it was about two months before we started shooting, they gave me um, the holster, which they called the rig, and they gave me the coal. And they gave me a guy by the name of Thel Reed. Thel Reed was a quick gun artist. He was one of these guys, great, like five balloons up, you know. And he could, you know, he was, he was like a world champion at this. But he also knew a little bit of, like, gun stuff and gun, gun tricks or whatever you want to call it. So he basically showed me some stuff, you know, turning the gun. One of the things that he showed me was that I didn't know could happen was that you could take a gun and because of, you can actually twist it, like, sideways like this without it falling out of out of your hands and he taught me that i thought that was really cool so then i taught myself to do, go back and do it the other way and i believe that they call it a fan so must a fan, somebody must have already have done it but i think that in my mind i kind of came up with this thing that i was doing you know and that whole routine that you saw in that movie uh, was a routine that I put together with Thel, and and I could I could do that routine. Okay, now in the movie, of course, it's cut here and cut there, and it's cut here and close up there, and a close up on Bill going like, wow, you know, and you know, so it, you you know. It's a little bit like a gymnastics routine, you know? Uh, probably maybe once or twice out of 10 tries, once maybe out of 10 tries, I could do that routine perfectly, that entire routine. The rest of the time, you know, you might miss your holster a little bit, you might not be able to like, when I pull that up and I pull that out on Val, I pull that gun up and I, twist it and I cock it at the same time, which is not, you know, and, you know, sometimes the gun will just like go flying out of your hands and it's a little bit like falling off the parallel bars or, or, or whatever. So, um, like, I could do that routine and I was very proud of that and I, you know, I've never seen anybody do anything like that in a Western before and um, I'm waiting for somebody to, I'll do my time tour. And here's something else, and I'm sure you'll all be interested in, in, in it. If you've already seen Val, maybe he's talked about it or not. But Val is a very um, uh, intense, not intense, but uh, he works really very, very hard. And I'm telling you that any time that you put a holster and a coal on anybody, like the Westerns, any Western you do, all men and women sometimes, they always want to play with it, like try to learn it, do stuff, you know, it's, like, it's fun, it's like a yo-yo or whatever. But Val, I'm telling you, would walk around the set with that little cup all the time. I would see Val like, going, doing this and then doing that, and it wasn't easy. It was, that was not, any, that cup was not made for twirling, like my, my coat was like, it had shaved corners on it so it didn't cut me up and stuff, and it was like weighted perfectly, and, and he would walk around and spend hours, you know, walking around the set talking and like doing this thing with the cup. So, you know, Val and I got together, and um, when we did the, 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 the scene at the end of the movie, we got together, uh, when they were shooting something else, and Val and I decided how we were going to uh, block that last gunfight. And we decided instead of 
big, you know, him over there and me over here, like every movie you've ever seen before, that we were going to be standing right next to each other. And we decided that we were going to kind of gonna move around each other. And we decided after I got shot that I was going to like, you know, you know, how I was going to act and that I would still be pulling the trigger even though I had a bullet through my brain. And so when we came, came time to shoot that uh, scene, uh, we just did it because we had gone out and rehearsed that scene the day before and that's the thing about Val and a lot of people say, you know, a lot of people call me difficult to work with, you know. They call me, I'm difficult to work with because, you know, I want to go out and rehearse this scene, you know, or I want to change something that doesn't make any sense. And, um, you know, most times when you hear that somebody's difficult, it's because they want to get it right. They don't suffer fools and they don't want to look like a jackass on screen. And uh, that's why that scene was uh, so good, I think. And um, there you go. Chill. I'd like to ask about uh, your work with Quentin Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez and sort of how that launched a career for you in directing as well. Um, you were in Grindhouse, uh, or Planet Terror, the Planet Terror half of Grindhouse. And, uh, you know, Rodriguez was there shooting, and Quentin Tarantino was shooting as well. And I mean, what's it like being around the energy of directors like that, as opposed to say James Cameron and, and William Friedkin? And well, <laughs> Friedkin, wow. Uh, you know, I, you know, I could, I, I don't, you know, want to spend too much time. I could talk about Friedkin for an hour. Um, I could talk about Robert Rodriguez for an hour. I could talk about Quentin for an hour. Quentin was in the movie. He was always around. Um, and um, Robert Rodriguez is one of the most interesting uh, and fun people to work for that um, I've ever worked for. He is so creative and so um, almost bigger than life. He's like the cool kid at school that you want to hang out with. And, and film-wise, I mean, we would do a scene, and uh, just to give you an idea, we would shoot a, 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 the kind of guy that he is. We would shoot a scene. The scenes are made up of shots, you know, master, and then you go in for, you know, closer shot and a two shot, two shot over here. Each one is a setup, you know, and it takes time to set it up and light it, so on and so forth. And um, each shot, you know, so so you shoot a, a scene that way, and uh, you do the whole scene, but certain cameras are like, you know, on certain people, and so on and so forth. And what he would do is he would bring his editor onto the set, and he would basically shoot the master and then go in for the close-ups and then go in for like like the, the the wide and then like a single and then a single here. And as he was shooting the, the movie, he would have his editor putting each one together on, the, and he would edit it while you were like shooting it. And so by the time he did the last shot of the day and got the scene done, it took half a day, it took half a day, if it was a three-page scene, it might have taken all day to shoot, he would basically have the scene cut already, and then he would take some source music that he had on his, uh, on his phone and throw it in there, and basically, you could see the whole scene cut together. And he said, this is the way it's going to be in the movie, and that's exactly the way that it was in the movie. So to work for somebody like that, um, uh, I always have a, 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 a mental uh, thing with uh, the guy who played W, I always forget his name. Josh Brolin. Brolin, yeah. And I, Josh and I actually spent a lot of time together. I don't know why his name always throws me, but uh, Josh, Josh and I hung out a lot. Josh and I, uh, you know, used to hang out. We, we used to have a lot of fun. He's a very funny guy. And uh, 
He does a lot of impressions, and he's a very creative guy, and he knew Robert really well. But the, um, um, the, The Who Brothers, the what brothers that did the uh, the film that kind of launched uh, Who? It's the Coen Brothers. Coen Brothers, the Coen Brothers. The Coen Brothers um, basically wanted him to uh, go down and, 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 and audition for uh, a film that they were doing. And, um, you know, he really couldn't do it because he was shooting on our set. And um, so he wasn't available to go audition for the brothers. And um, so what, the, or what Robert did during lunch was basically take him, Josh, and uh, uh, the female... Lead and not Rose McGowan, not Rose, it was the other girl, the blonde girl. Um, and basically shot the um, pa uh, pages that the uh, the Coen brothers had sent uh, to him, and basically shot the scene during lunch. And they put it together, and he cut it together, and sent it off to the Coen brothers, and he got cast in that movie. And that's Robert Rodriguez, you know. I mean, fabulous guy. Uh, and I, he kind of, you know, when you read uh, Rebel Without a Crew, he kind of gave me the idea. A lot of people have always said, you should direct, you should direct, you should direct. And I never really wanted to, but I, I never really felt I was visually that good. All the other stuff I could do pretty well. But um, I decided, uh, you know, that I did a movie called The Divide, and a lot of people, a lot of you probably haven't seen The Divide, but if you want to see a movie, it's not a real feel-good movie. That's, it's a little requiem for a dreamish, you know? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a tough movie to watch, but um, Xavier Jens directed it, and Xavier um, did the hitman, had a lot of problems with Fox, and uh, went on to do this movie. And it's about six or seven of us that are in this, uh, uh, like there's been some sort of nuclear thing, and, and we're in this uh, uh, guy's shelter, and it was my shelter. And um, I watched one of his earlier movies, and um, I thought the skies were so beautiful in his movies. It's like, Zombie, how do you how do you shoot this? And like the skies are so beautiful. He says, "Oh, Michael, we shoot, we shoot, we shoot Dave Renette. This is Dave Renette. He's a French guy. It's my French accent. And uh, <laughs> shoot Dave for night. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And he and he said I should do a movie. And I, I had a guy approach me with a script once that like needed a lot of work, a lot of work. Uh, it's a first time script. And it, it um, kind of read like a, a novella. I got offered uh, 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 to be in the movie, and I was like, I, I, I don't think so. It just needed a lot of work. And then I had a guy that approached me that uh, wanted to uh, play Burt Lancaster. Looked just like Burt Lancaster, and he wanted to play Burt Lancaster back in the day when he was a trapeze artist and so on and so forth. And I said, well, how much money do you have? He's got, well, I've got $500,000. I'm like, dude, you ain't making any movie about Burt Lancaster back in the 20s or whenever that was on $500,000. And you just don't have enough money to do it. That's a $50 million movie. Um, and so eventually, I stayed in contact with him, and eventually I had the idea of, of taking that script, rewriting that script, which was a really a, what they call a page one rewrite, and shooting that movie, and um, directing it. And 
I went back to uh, him, and he said, well, I don't have $500,000 anymore. I got, well, I, what, what do you have? And he said, well, I got about $120,000. And I said, okay, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll write and direct this movie. But my name still meant a little bit overseas and so on and so forth, and it's pretty good for, like, if people who are buying DVDs, they see me and William Forsyth or something like that on the DVD, and they think, oh, I don't know, this guy does good stuff, and so they'll buy it overseas and stuff. So I had $120,000. I paid myself 60 of it to write it, to star in it, to direct it, and um, produce it, basically. And I paid my wife Jennifer seven thousand dollars, and I paid him about seven thousand dollars. So the they their uh, so their health 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 plan through the Screen Actors Guild would be up to date, and their health care would be up to date and in the highest order. So that was sixty plus about fifteen would be seventy five thousand dollars. So that's 25 and 20. So we made it really for about $45,000. I wrote that in 12 days. While I was writing the movie, I did all pre-production, which is not how you want to do pre-production. You want to have a you want to have a finished script in front of you and say, "Okay, we're going to need a car here and this actress here and we we need this wardrobe here and we I did all the, I, I cast it, I crewed it up. I, I, I knew in my mind what I wanted to do, and I was like, you know, casting it, you know, picking out, you know, you know, cars and locations, and Jennifer was dealing with the, the Screen Actors Guild, and we were casting it. All the pre-production we did in 12 days. Now, The Terminator was considered a low-budget movie at the time, $6.5 million, and it, 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 you know, it was 11 weeks of shooting. So I shot this movie in 11 day, uh, 12 days. I wrote it, did all the pre-production, and then shot it in 12 days. Uh, this is kind of Roger Corman style kind of stuff, yeah. you know. And because uh, we didn't have any money, we didn't have any time, and um, uh, so we were doing. When I talk about setups, is like you have a camera. You know, and then you move the camera, that's another setup. We were doing 60 setups a day. You know, a Jim Cameron movie, you'll do one or two. <laughs> you know, and um, so basically from start to finish, from the idea that I was, I didn't even have the, the script finished while we started shooting. So we, Jennifer and I started, we started shooting that movie with the love scene because I didn't have the movie even finished. And then we worked our way up the hallway. And if you ever see it, you have to realize, you look at it and you go, oh, it's okay, but you gotta realize it was made for about $40,000. Well, it looks like we're out of time with you, and I want to thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, I could talk all night about myself. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you all for coming. Can you guys give it up right here for Michael B. and Amy Soy?